Welcome, everybody. My name is uh, Ronald Neeson. I'm uh, uh, a Pierce, the Pier Catherine A. Pearson Chair in Civil Society and Public Policy, and I'm the moderator of this event, which is the fifth uh, Dialogue on Human Rights and Legal Pluralism, hosted by McGill's Law Faculty's Center for, Legal, uh, for Human Rights and, and Legal Pluralism. And our topic today is a dialogue on Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. Um, first, I'd like to introduce or have uh, our, my two uh, co-panelists introduce themselves, Mark Antaki and Christ Kristen Anker. And then I'll in introduce myself, I suppose, when you're done, and we'll, we'll, we'll then get started from there. Do you want to st start, uh, Mark? Uh, I'm, I'm Mark Antaki. I teach at the law faculty here. Um, what more would you like me to? I'd like to maybe get into something slightly more autobiographical than a go-around, talking about your connection to the, to the topic we're discussing today. Okay. Well, today's dialogue for me, in a way, I kind of, I'm here because I responded to a call to action from Nandini. <laughs> uh, and so uh, p part of why I'm here is precisely uh, as someone who's responded to a call and is coming to think about what it means to respond to the call as I'm doing it afterwards. But there's some other reasons why I'm here, some of which are tied to, uh, to language and to reflecting uh, about language. So when I hear call to action right away, I start thinking about what does it mean to be called? How does one respond to a call? Uh, what is action? And then trying to think about some of the alternatives to call to action. Why is it calls to action rather than recommendations, for instance? which is something that the three of us talked about in, in previous conversations. And then I guess uh, I'm also here as someone who is constantly obsessed with what it means to take up space. What does it mean to perform authority? Uh, and that's a, 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 what does it mean to be somewhere and have a, have a presence there? And that's something that's intimately tied to, to being an immigrant to, to Canada and to be here and to figure out what does it mean for, for me to be here. Great. Kirsten? So I'm going to start by uh, acknowledging where we are on the island of Jokjage, which is the Ganegeha word for, for Montreal, and to uh, acknowledge that this is a, a place that has been special to the Haudenosaunee and to the Algonquin peoples for, for a very long time. Um, and uh, to acknowledge myself as a student in this place rather than an expert about anything in particular. Um, and I guess the knowledge that I have now that uh, that leads me to do this kind of beginning, uh, I definitely didn't have that growing up. Uh, I grew up in, in a, a small town in Australia. I had indigenous friends, but I didn't really know anything about uh, who they were, except for that they were maybe a little different from us. Uh, and it wasn't until I, um, till I started teaching and the class I was teaching had a, a as a case study, the, the first recognition of native title in Australia. Um, so my interest in, in the TRC is sort of part of a, a larger interest in, in issues around uh, colonization and injustice uh, uh, relating to indigenous peoples. I realized uh, at that point in time, I guess, that my growing up and not really knowing much was part of um, what I call a kind of terra nullius of the imagination. So uh, this is not, terra nullius was not just a legal doctrine that means uh, land belonging to no one that, that justified colonization in Australia, but also a kind of way of seeing. So when, when I'd look at the, at, the, at the land around me, I would see the, a place that w had been empty until my ancestors built fences and so on. So, uh, so my interest has been partly kind of relearning who I am, the history of my country and so on. Um, and then my particular kind of the intellectual angle that I've taken uh, in native title, I got very caught up in the, the idea that it was a recognition of uh, a title to land that came from another legal, another legal system, another legal order. Um, what does it mean to have two or more legal traditions that exist? This is more common in Canada, but in Australia it was pretty unusual to talk that way. Uh, so I became very interested in the question of legal pluralism. What does it mean to, uh, for this to be taking in, in place in the context of, of claims for justice and, and the sort of unbalanced nature of this recognition claim? It was always claims for recognition to the state and so on. So that's the kind of angle I bring to the TRC. Um, what does it tell us about the language uh, of 
making and responding to claims? Uh, what does it tell us about the different legal orders that are coming into play and, uh, and the kind of intercultural relationships between people? Great, thank you. Maybe I should say a little bit uh, uh, for the people here and the people watching about my own background. Um, uh, my parents were immigrants from Holland and I grew up in various small towns in British Columbia, one of which was Port Alberni which happened to be the site of one of the more notorious schools that had been in operation shortly before we lived there. In fact, I think it was in operation during the time that, that I was there. I revisited that place, uh, Port Alberni, and the, res the, 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 uh, the reservation where the residential school had been, uh, had been situated. And there were so many emotions associated with that school that the community had decided to demolish the building, even though it was still, it was still a, a perfectly functional, usable building, and to perform ceremonies of purification on the site, to rid themselves of the memory of this school and the harms it had committed. This was the focal point. This was the site, the location of the notorious sexual offender, uh, Plint, who had, whose case went to the Supreme Court and was a focal point of much of the, of the, of some of the litigation that led to the justification for the, for, for the TRC. So just quickly by way of background, because we're talking about some of the circumstances and the legal background to the Truth, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The TRC arose out of litigation having to do with 139 federally run Indian residential schools, boarding schools, had removed Aboriginal children from their families with a view to assimilating them to the Canadian mainstream. They were uh, sites that had no accountability over the handling of the children. And like many total institutions, like some other total institutions, like orphanages, the Duplessis orphans in Quebec are well known, these, uh, these institutions became very commonly sites of institutional abuse on a, on a significant scale. And this became particularly salient when uh, uh, lawsuits began to occur in the 1990s. And by the early 2000s, there were uh, several thousands of lawsuits uh, pending. And finally, a class action lawsuit prompted by the Assembly of First Nations, uh, holding the governments and churches responsible for uh, some tens of billions of dollars in damages led to the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement, which was negotiated and then ratified in 2008. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission began its work in to, to, to 2010 with its opening uh, national event in Winnipeg. Um, and it, it addressed the legacy of some um, more than 100, 100 years of, of these residential schools being in operation, 150,000 students who'd been incarcerated in them, uh, some 80,000 of whom are alive today. And so, uh, as a researcher, I attended the seven national events and some community events um, and watched the TRC very closely. It became the topic of my research. My research is both uh, in anthropology and law, so I, I approached the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission and its activities as an ethnographer and approached it with the methods of institutional ethnography and also thinking about its legal legacy as well. So with that as a background, I want to ad address the issue of the calls to action. The 94 calls to action are a very unusual uh, outcome of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And they're having, I think, a significant effect on the way that we think about, in particular, about the, the, the teaching of law and the legal relationship of, this, of the Canadian state with with the Aboriginal peoples in Canada. Um, so I want to begin perhaps by um, thinking about what you see in the 
in the calls to action that that have the the most significance for uh, rethinking that re relationship and reinstitutionalizing it. Um, so I, mean, I just want to make a preliminary comment, which is, so I've been in Canada for maybe 12 years now, and when I first started here, uh, I think the faculty hired me because they were interested in, uh, they could see from the work I'd done that they were interested in, in sort of bringing the trans-systemic idea and being more inclusive of indigenous traditions, and, and it's just, so, you know, that's something I've been working on. All that, all that time, uh, and it's just really interesting to see how something like this, how is it that a document has, has life? And so the, TRC, the TRC's call to actions have been taken up, and suddenly all the things that we were doing have got this extra energy, and, uh, and you know, I, I think they're giving maybe a, a focal point. Um, uh, of course, funding, it helps when, you know, I guess the, the higher, higher levels of the university have something concrete that they can kind of, you know, put behind their, um, their, their, their funding decisions. Um, so that's been a, a really nice sort of kind of injection of energy. Um, we've talked uh, previously about the particular aspects of the, the calls to action that, that do call us as, as lawyers. So some of them, if, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but some of them have to do with what we teach. Um, so teaching... Uh, uh, Cultural, uh, cultural sensitivity training, teaching the history of treaties, the history of Crown Aboriginal relations, teaching the, U the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, and also teaching Indigenous law, which is something, of course, in the tra trans-systemic uh, context has been, has been something we've been thinking about for a while and is, is a pretty big challenge uh, because it forces you to think about what law is and how it is that how we teach law and learn law is related to what law is. And what law does. And what law does, right. So, um, you know, of course, uh, this was a challenge. Going trans-systemic was a challenge just between the civil law and the common law, but to think about, well, how, how are you going to do that in a classroom setting? Is it, is it about changing the readings that you have? What if, what if you can't learn about law just through the written word? Well, what about having people come and speak, can you even learn about law necessarily just in a classroom? So it, it sort of makes you think, well, what is it that we think about our law that you can just sit 200 people in a room and have a talking head up the front and that's how you, how you learn law? So it sort of, uh, I find this constant sort of um, reiterative process or sort of mirroring back on myself in order to understand and learn about uh, what Indigenous law might mean. And I, I want to say at this point there's many different ways of thinking about Indigenous law. So you could think about positive laws of contemporary governments that have written codes, for instance, that is, is a form of Indigenous law. But um, there are also claims that are a little hard to even imagine what it might mean. So Sarkic Henderson, for instance, a, a renowned um, and senior Indigenous scholar, says that Indigenous contribution to jurisprudence, the biggest contribution is thinking about, uh, he's speaking to an Algonquin uh, way of thinking, but is law as dream. So what do you make of it? Like, where do you put that in a class? Like, so, uh, you know, there's, there's various claims that are being made on behalf of Indigenous legal practitioners that are very hard to fit into presumed understandings of what law is. So for me, that, that aspect of the call to action is really, um, you know, it's just sort of one little phrase in, in a couple of the calls, but is mind-blowingly large. Um, and of course, there's some, some other quite interesting ones um, to do with challenging the foundation of Canadian sovereignty. So there's a call, uh, number, f uh, number 50, no, 47, I'm not sure if I can remember the numbers, um, that, that uh, Canadian law and policy should um, get rid of any we should get rid of any law or policy that it relies on the doctrine of discovery or uh, terra nullius as sort of founding or justificatory principles. Um, well, what then founds Canadian sovereignty? We're left with this big sort of gaping hole uh, at the bottom of our legal system then that I think you know, will require a lot of, a lot of thought. One of, the, uh, one of the items that's been the focus of particular attention here is item 28 in the calls to action, which is uh, 
specifically directed towards legal education. And you touched on this already. Um, it seems to me n not as difficult to, it's fairly straightforward to teach indigenous law. It's fairly straightforward uh, for law faculties to get the expertise to teach um, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and other international instruments, the place of indigenous peoples in this sort of global movement, uh, what this means for domestic law, uh, Aboriginal law in Canada. But there's one item that you talked about in that list of things that's, that's particularly naughty. And, and that is teaching indigenous legal traditions and making that a part of our teaching. So I'm addressing this to to both of you, um, in circumstances in which we have tremendous diversity among Aboriginal peoples in Canada, with diverse legal traditions, um, with different histories of colonization and the consequences of colonization, with people who, in each in any one community, who are looking to the revitalization of traditions, but others who are not. Uh, in a community where I worked in Cross Lake, Manitoba, there were five denominations of Christianity, plus a group of people who were actively involved in bringing back Aboriginal traditions. So in this context of tremendous diversity and complexity, how do we teach indigenous law? in the law faculty? How do we do it without engaging in what for anthropologists is one of the worst intellectual sins you can do, essentializing, right? You don't want to be an essentialist, heaven forbid. You can call an anthropologist, by the way, all kinds of things. You can call their mother anything you want, but you don't call them an essentialist, right? So how do we avoid that sin of essentializing how is it possible? The opposite is particularizing, right? So you, you go local. Right. Um, that's what I tried to do in my, my course. It's impossible to teach Indigenous law across the whole of Canada, so I've had to like pinpoint different communities. And even then, I mean, it's just such a snapshot of history and different perspectives and different, you know, different ways of presenting law. But that is the way is to go particular. But then, you know, we think law is about generalities, right? Right. You can't escape. <laughs> it's about uh, the interesting thing about the law, the legal traditions that we teach, is they're about generalities and they're about boundaries, creating boundaries, sometimes literally and sometimes figuratively, right? Boundaries of inclusion and exclusion. And we don't see those in the kinds of legal traditions that we would be interested in. In teaching. There's one aphorism from a, a group in Northern Australia that I love. It's not that they don't have boundaries, and they, they certainly have like, they have two moiety systems in their sure, society sure. that everything is divided up, but the aphorism about boundaries, boundaries are to cross. So everything is about how you connect those and connect over those boundaries, and they have a lot of different metaphors for joining words, like uh, people have knee names, so a knee is a joint, it joins up two people, so that's But there are also territories, right? And you had to negotiate use of those territories if you didn't belong uh, in hunting societies. Right, right. So, um, yes, I mean, there's very... Uh, anyway, so trying to get away from the essentialism, go to the, the particulars, and try and just not skate over the complexities. So a lot of these uh, groups, when, you know, there's kind of a, an essentialism in thinking about, uh, about indigenous legal traditions and kind of the authenticity um, game that goes around right. that as if the Christian groups are not authentically indigenous. And so how do you account for the great impact that colonization has had on the way people live their lives, the way they think of themselves, the way they... And the way they think of, the, of, law, of law and of their sovereignty. Um, Mark wants to say something. Well, I'm curious what you, both of you think about, given that one of the great harms of the residential schools was loss of language, and one of my intuitions is to learn law is to learn a language. What do you think then about the uh, necessity to learn indigenous languages in order to be able to learn uh, indigenous legal traditions? We have a requirement of passive bilingualism, of learning French and of being students being able to, to understand uh, 
both French and English, which is in some ways tied to the, the trans-systemic program and, and the kind of bidrealism. So I'm curious about, and this goes to the question of revival that, that, that you were speaking about, is if my intuition is to learn indigenous legal traditions means to learn in indigenous languages, but yet we have great loss on the mm -hmm. language mm -hmm. front as a result of the residential schools, where does that place us in terms of our response to the call to action as a law faculty? Right, and language is is a consequence. Language loss is a complicated process too. Surely the residential schools were, were calibrated in order to hasten that loss of language. But loss of language happens when you, through the simple process of moving from a life on the land to life in, in, a, in a community, in a village. Um, many of the, the words in Cree having studied that language a bit, r relate to natural phenomenon that are, that are connected to activities on the land. Um, I remember an elder once commenting that he couldn't really speak Cree in a meaningful way with the young people in the community because he says they, what they have basically is baby talk. Um, they, they don't have the, even those who've acquired the language don't have the reference points in the, in the environment that would allow you to construct the kinds of metaphor that would be used in a meaningful dialogue, in a meaningful political and legal dialogue. So it isn't just a question of language loss, but it's a question of language loss combined with the kinds of meaning and metaphor and connection to an environment that would, that would facilitate um, uh, legal en engagement um, with one's I interlocutor and having a community of people that it, it, in which that uh, process would happen. Um, so you, 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 you're a student of language. This is your, your expertise and legal language. Uh, may, maybe you have some insight into that. I, I wouldn't say it's my expertise, but I'm... I'm uh, kind of obsessed with with language, even though I'm not that great at learning them. Uh, <laughs> maybe that's why I'm so obsessed with them. Um, and one of the things I'm really interested in is, is that we spoke about another time, the three of us, was the kind of ways in which language gets separated from body, like decorporealized, right? So that we turn uh, language that's da danced and sung and and uh, lived corporally into propositions, right? Which is tied to how we think about where and how law is, right? Law is in these written propositions on, on these pages, right? Law is writable in, in propositional form, as, as Marion Constable uh, would say. So I'm curious then about the, the and then what you were saying about the, 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 the Cree language, uh, reminds me of like, well, where am I when I'm speaking and why does it matter, right? That language is not just something we can I use as this abstract universal means of communication, but it's tied to, to place and, and person in a particular way. I guess one thing I'm also really interested in is the experience of a speaker of a language. Uh, I think we had spoken previously, but what does it feel like to speak a certain language? And I teach a seminar on Plato's Republic, and so I've been reading up on the Greek language a little bit, and this idea that, well, we may experience language in a way, as English speakers, for instance, where you decide where you put your accent, you decide how long your syllables are, there's, syllables are, there's an experience of control over language. And I'm really interested in experiences of language where you don't control the language. You have to contend with it, you have to inhabit it, but it's solid. And it's not just something you get to manipulate as you wish. Right, there's a continuum between, you know, feeling like language is a tool that, you know, the eye inside your head gets to use to achieve a social goal, and that model for law, that law is simply a tool that we can adapt and shape to, you know, and we, we get to be in control. And if you have a different way of experiencing language, then you have a different way of experiencing law. And we, we talked about this anecdote from a, a friend of mine who's Mi'kmaq, and I, when I asked him how he experiences, what, how does it feel like to speak Mi'kmaq, and he said, well, it feels like we borrow the sounds from the grass and the trees and the martens and, and everything else. So if you, f if you feel like the, the, f the feel of the sound in your mouth is that you are simply borrowing that from something else, I don't know, I, I guess it, <laughs> it changes the way you, you use it, right? There's, in relation to states, 
indigenous or customary law or however you want to formulate it has another element of a problematic relationship. I'm thinking in particular of my, my other background, which is, is as an Africanist. And in the African context, in the, in the colonial context, you have a very complicated history of relationships between customary law and states. And that relationship is characterized by states that in a sense want to define what custom is for their own purposes. So customary law becomes enveloped in a state system. It becomes a level of uh, sort of the legal institution. It becomes codified and, and defined in such a way that in some cases it almost becomes unrecognizable from its origins, uh, which similar to the kinds of legal traditions we're looking at are connected to local languages, lo local environments, and so on. So when you, when, you try to, when you try to define indigenous Aboriginal customary law in such a way that it becomes legible by the state, isn't there a process by which it becomes something else? And what is that something else? Mm -hmm. And the legal pluralist in me would also say, well, maybe there's a state version of customary law, but there's also a people's version of state law. You know, it happened in the other direction as well. Um, so John Burroughs has, I mean, he's someone you may have heard of, an Anishinaabe legal scholar um, who spent um, most of his career trying to convince judges and lawyers and other people that Indigenous law was not too weird, not too strange to be recognised and it should form part of the collective legal traditions of, of Canada. And he makes this, um, he, he, he has a sort of heuristic at one point where he takes a, um, an Anish traditional Anishinaabe story and turns it into case law. He says, look, you can read our stories for their legal worth for their legal value, for legal principles, just as you could the case law in, in the common law. Um, and at the end of it, he's, uh, he says, OK, well, you know, I'm, I'm liable to get criticism for this because I have translated it. So I've and maybe mistranslated it, and it's been taken out of its original context. But um, the storyteller in Anishinaabe tradition has always been a trickster, so someone who, who transforms himself as kind of this magical um, surreal aspect to the, the trickster's powers. Um, and if this is necessary to keep Indigenous law uh, current and, you know, um, and living, then, then why not? Why not change the story form? Um, so I've always struggled a little, you know, the, the other version of that is the sort of other side of that coin is to say, well, uh, and Saka Chenderson makes, makes this claim that, you know, it's uh, Indigenous law is so tied to ceremonies, places, language, um, and, and, you know, other aspects of context that it can't be translated. So, you know, uh, I don't know if there's a, a middle ground and, and maybe, you know, in some ways we are always translating all the time from one person to another, from one register to another register. We could think about the whole of the justice system, as James Boyd White does, as you know, justice as translation. Um, so then the question is, you know, sort of how <laughs> how different are the languages that you're translating between? Um, and one thing that I have, one point I've come to from looking at uh, theories of translation in literature, like what make what is it that makes a good translation? Is it a translation that when you read it, you don't notice that it has been translated? So you read Anna Karenina in English and it's just a beautiful novel that could be written by an English person. Or when you read it, do you, is there something that's not quite right about the sentences because they are trying to convey to you something of the uniqueness of the way Russian grammar and imagery works? Um, and you know, m so the argument is that an ethical translation, yet we all have to translate in order to communicate with one another, but an ethical translation will always sort of leave this trace of the impossibility of actually uh, you know, doing complete justice to the original translation, um, and that somehow we will get a, a sense of, the, of what's being left out or what, what is impossible to translate in that. Um, so there needs to be more of a struggle, I guess, and you certainly, for all the gestures there are in Supreme Court jurisprudence and so on to um, the pers indigenous perspectives on rights, and so you, you never see them really tussle with uh, 
And there's a couple of throwaway lines about, oh, Mi'kmaq, Mi'kmaq think about culture like this, or the Haudenosaunee have the two-row wampum, but, but to actually grapple with how difficult it is to, to communicate across, across these, um, these cultures, it's, it's right. not there. What, what we have, and I think that uh, uh, what a lot of the calls to action uh, of the TRC have in common is, is, a, is a deep, <coughs> deep history of mistranslation. So if we, if we just look at the treaty relationships between Aboriginal people and states, and we think about how those treaties were negotiated, and what was the process by which we got those, Canada got those signatures, for example, on the numbered treaties that gave them, that gave them access to all of these territories and resources. How is it that that, how is it that, that took place? And, and if, if we see mistranslation uh, take literal form in the way that negotiations took place, how is it that there is a more metaphorical mistranslation in a lot of the institutions that are at the root of the relationship? Um, it's something that's w w worth thinking about. Um, and I think that this is one of the things that the TRC is is attempting to address. It's looking at a, a deep mistranslation between the goals of the state, which saw Aboriginal people as being impoverished and needing, you know, the sort of ward approach to Aboriginal peoples, that they are our responsibility. We see that they are uh, not to receive, uh, not to, uh, not equitably receiving the benefits of civilization. We need to give them access to those benefits. What's the best way? We remove them from their families. You know, this, there, was a, there was this sort of, uh, in some cases, a well-meaning intent behind mm -hmm. this uh, policy of removal. Um, a distorted well-meaning intent that we see in retrospect a fundamental mistranslation, uh, a deafness to what it was that Aboriginal people themselves aspired to. Um, is this something that we can, I'm, I'm talking, uh, I, I'm probably uh, having a, my own dialogue here as I'm <laughs> formulating a question, but is, is, there, is there something in this that we can think about more broadly? Uh, well, at least one of the th things I think that you're inviting us to think about is usually we think of TRCs as part of mechanisms of so-called transitional justice, which are supposed to be mechanisms that bring uh, authoritarian regimes to liberal regimes, right? So there's this idea that there's a society that's fundamentally flawed or problematic and it needs to be reconstituted or constituted for the first time. And so you have this transition from apartheid past to human rights future, for instance. Right. And depending on how bad the translation or mistranslation is that you're talking about, that, that involves uh, living uh, the calls to action as part of a, some kind of reconstitution. Uh, because if the hearing, proper hearing will be for the first time if it's possible, well then that means that there's a massive reconstitution that's required, and to the extent that the mistranslation wasn't such a big deal, there was good, good listening and so on, well then we don't really need a, a reconstitution. And so I find that interesting that there's a mechanism that's, that's, a, that's a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which is usually tied to, well, we have to learn to become a, a good world citizen, a proper state, and we, were, we weren't before. And then right, there's, there's gonna no be civil war at the basis. Nothing that you could look at as a as a humanitarian crisis in the usual sense. And, and another aspect of that is that in other TRCs, you have, you have a public awareness of the issue, right? Nobody needs to be reminded in Guatemala that there was a civil war leading to their Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, were, were there any people in South Africa that didn't know what apartheid was? when the Truth Commission began its work. On the other hand, in Canada, if you're to do a survey even now, like your average person on the street, you'll find many, many, many people who don't know about the history of residential schools. This is after the TRC 
has done its work, right? Uh -huh. Before, I think there was some awareness, the T but the TRC saw its goal, its mission, its calls, its own call to action, to be to raise awareness of the history of these schools. It's about making making a circumstance public, right? So education for reconciliation. Education as, for as, reconciliation as part of the calls to right. to action. And yet, you know, a lot of critiques of it. Uh, one, one text uses the title carnivalesque, so if you know the history of Carnivale, right, it's, it's uh, this idea, okay, you have this established religious order that, uh, you know, some people are on the top, some people on the bottom, and then you have one day, one day of the year when you let everyone go crazy and let it all out, and <laughs> you reverse the, the, the paupers become the kings and so on, and, right. and, you know, all the dirt, all the dirt that is normally, like, tucked away in the corner gets, gets uh, let out, so the sense is that this is sort of a venting process, you keep it nice and contained, and then you can go back on with business as, as usual. So it's really, you know, rather than reconstituting the state in any meaningful way, it's a way of allowing pretty much things to go on as, usu as usual because you've given it this little space. Right. That, that makes sense. And I guess there, 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 there have been analysis of other TRCs, uh, like the South, South African one, which see them interpolate beneficiaries and basically tell beneficiaries it's enough if you feel good about feeling bad and you can hold on to what you have. And I guess what seems weird here then is our beneficiaries, uh, myself in included, interpolated by the TRC right. if there's a widespread ignorance of this kind of stuff and who's being interpolated and how, who's being called to action and how. And that seems interesting that, that uh, at least in the carnivalesque moment, everyone knows what's happening or should be mm -hmm. aware of what's happening when the pauper becomes king mm -hmm. and, and vice versa. And a lot of what I heard about the the various um, you know various um, events that they had for the TRC that a lot of it was about indigenous people to indigenous so talking to families and apologizing for what had happened you know also expressing expressing you know the the pain and and so on of the of the experiences but that it wasn't set up as a, as a dialogue, two sides coming together. I mean you did a lot more work on this than I did, but perhaps you could comment. But. My experience was that the federal government was the least present party. And yet, uh, the federal government is seen as being, uh, in, in the majority, uh, responsible for the, the residential schools, legally responsible, which to me was very surprising. In many of the national events, you would have uh, n never the prime minister, but a, a, a minister, usually a minister of Indian Affairs, uh, or a deputy minister, come in, during the opening events, during the first sort of uh, event that was sponsored by the, by the commission, say a few supportive words about the commission and its work, and then get on a plane when that was done. Nobody was there listening to the testimony and, and making at least a symbolic appearance that they were, uh, that this was a significant event. We had the Harper government in office during the time of the TRC, and I think that there was a, there was a distancing. The, the event, in a way, was politically dangerous, right? The more you associate yourself with these harms, the more responsibility you have to take as a government for, for dealing with it. Um, and this gets me to something else that, I, that I, want, I want to raise, and that is how this was possible. Um, the mandate of the, of the TRC did not even give the commission the power to subpoena, to compel testimony, right? So it became one of the kinds of commissions that are now recognized as, the, as those that are soliciting testimony from survivors or victims, as they're various co variously called. So it's the mandate of the commission that, that gave a certain regime of power to the commission that produced a certain kind of testimony <coughs> and, that, and that allowed the federal government as a responsible party to maintain that kind of distance, to create obstacles to the work of the commission, mm -hmm. right? More than not being present, <coughs> to obstruct the process of documenting, of, of, uh, of creating a record, of situating it in the history of the schools. The government, mm -hmm. yeah.
<coughs> so from from a from the perspective of somebody who of people who are aware of of what a what an institutional mandate can produce. Maybe this is something that we need to reflect on too, and to make public, right? A TRC is not, a t is not like every TRC. A TRC is something that is constructed out of law. And what's surprising to me in the TRC, one of the surprises is that out of this weak mandate, you nevertheless then get a set of recommendations or calls to action that are, that are out of keeping with that mandate. Mm. Right? So in spite of a weak mandate, in spite of the federal government not participating, there was still something interesting and compelling that came out of it. Right? This is something I'm, I'm curious about in this type. I just thought about it in response to what, what you're just saying is that um, you can think of TRCs in some ways, some of them as, I guess, supposed to perform a kind of rule of law. And so some analyses of the South African TRC, because of the different setup as to here, think well, it's about individuating perpetrators and individuating victims, and so you lose sight of structural systemic problems in, in the performance of it, even if you're kind of paying, if you're, if you're addressing them to some degree. And so maybe the, the so-called weakness uh, of the Canadian one allows things to be perhaps spoken to in a more systemic structural way that there's not the same performance of the rule of law because they're not the same legal forms here. So that would be an interesting way to, to think about weakness as potentially opening up opportunities that might not be present in the exact same way elsewhere where, where the idea is perhaps because of the widespread conflict and polarization and implication of, of so-called everyone in the in the society that you need to individuate things to make it not everyone's problem. Well, here, do you have the same focus on individuation? And if not, does that open up opportunities for addressing things in a systemic way? Yeah, I mean, I mean, some of the key parts of the call to action that we mentioned before definitely go to that systemic aspect and point to some of the problems with the founding of the Canadian state. I didn't see anywhere in this, so, uh, you know, what was the, I think about this in terms of the apology. What, what, what are we apologizing, apologizing for? So yes, this was a mistake. We should never have separated children from their families and so on. The apology did not mention the Indian Act as a problem per se that authorized this, nor the part of the constitution that makes Indians and lands reserved for Indians as a sort of subject matter for federal power instead of, you know, instead of having a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. So the sort of calling into question the very constitutional power that was being exercised in, uh, you know, in assuming wardship over, over indigenous children and so on, uh, it's not being brought into question. Um, and that's not mentioned in the calls to action, but there is obviously attempts to, to think sort of foundationally about uh, what are the roots of this problem? The roots of the, this problem are in, co problem are in colonization um, and the assumption of control over territories and people. It, it would be, in some ways, it's kind of strange to think, well, you can separate the question of residential schools from questions of Indian Act and politics. Like in, what Im in what imagination mm -hmm. is it possible to separate that mm -hmm. out? There's the question of education, and then there's the question of politics. Mm -hmm. There's kids, and then there's political mm -hmm. life. And, you know, even in so-called Western tradition, you, we don't always do that. The Plato's Republic will speak to education and kids, and there'll be a moment where there's even, well, let's expel everyone who's over 10, and then we'll, we'll rework the polis from the children, right? So in what imagination can we somehow separate a, the question of, mm -hmm. of children from the question of politics and sovereignty? Like, that's a weird imagination, it, it, it seems to me. That really struck me when I first moved to a, uh, here from Australia because so we had a reconciliation movement that sort of took off in the mid-1990s and the, the native title decision that I, that I referred to earlier was part of that. There was also a, we had a, a similar phenomenon of taking children, it was called the Stolen Generation, so we had a Royal Commission into that that, that gave a report around the same time. And, and the, recon the reconciliation movement took off. I mean, it, 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 there was a council that was established through the federal government and so on, but it really kind of took off as a people's, you know, there were marches 
2,000 people, 2,000, 200,000 people crossed the Sydney Harbour Bridge demanding an apology from the Prime Minister and so on. And, and I, maybe because the government was recalcitrant, it sort of, it took off a little bit more at a grass li grassroots level. Um, but it was kind of a holistic, like reconciliation was understood to be about colonisation in general. And so when I came here, reconciliation was kind of a key word in a couple of contexts, but it was in very sort of piecemeal ways. So reconciliation was one of the key words that the Supreme Court uses to interpret Section 35. So you understand reconciliation, I mean, it has a, a number of iterations and evolution, but it ends up being reconciling the crown sovereignty with the prior existence of Aboriginal peoples and then later on peoples with peoples. Um, but it's kind of this very technical, I mean, it doesn't have a general public presence, I don't think. It was a very sort of technical part of Supreme Court interpretation of Section 35, and then, if, and then you have reconciliation in the context of residential schools, which, to my thinking, doesn't really touch the average Canadian. I don't really see how they're implicated in that. It's, yeah, a bad thing that happened in the past. Um, so it's, it's divided the sense of, you know, um, constitutional relations, territorial claims, that belongs over there in Section 35, and then they've got the residential schools over here, instead of kind of seeing it all as part of, part of a, a whole. Can we see the reconciliation talk with respect to the residential schools replaying potentially what happened with Section 35, where you have early Section 35 case laws saying Section 35 promises justice, and then reconciliation is the word that comes and replaces justice, <laughs> so it's not, right? So that is that what is, recon what, are, what is reconciliation, what is the alternative to reconciliation? Right. It's, it's and so such it's an interesting polysemic word. Like, you look it up in the dictionary, there's like three quite distinct definitions that are not at all consistent. So, you know, there's the, the accounting version. So, we've got, you know, we've got two different sides of our ledger and we're going to reconcile them and sort of make them all neat. Or you've got, uh, like, couples that have a fight and then they reconcile each other. So, you have to have, an, you have, to have a pre-existing relationship before you... You have to be consiled before you can reconcile. So, of course, there's people who take that angle and say, well, we never had conciliation, so how can we have reconciliation? And then there's the one that, you know, it seems to be quite... Uh, predominant too is well I'm just gonna reconcile myself to my fate you know like the state is there and this stuff happened and we're just gonna have to live with it let's face it we're all here to stay is the final line of of uh, Delgamok right so and I think the court and the court never specifies which one of these is being called upon and deliberately so I would say you know you, you get something out of playing with that polysemy yeah. well until oh sorry what uh, one of the things that I noticed in attending and listening to a survivor group was another iteration of reconciliation. And that, and that was uh, the sense that somebody said when, when they remarked, we as Aboriginal people know how to reconcile among ourselves, right? That we have traditions and mm -hmm. we are able to do this. What isn't said in that statement is that reconciling with our neighbors, our non-Aboriginal neighbors, is a much more fraught and difficult process. And we see this in, the, in a way in the structure of the commission. By, by having it oriented principally towards testimony of survivors and survivor families, and by looking at the consequences of the schools, what's missing, I would say, from the work of the commission that might have also influenced how we look at reconciliation is testimony from the people who are seen as being responsible for the schools, the governments, the people, not just the churches, but the people in the churches who ran the schools, who have their own experience and their own narrative to talk about. It's much more difficult to understand than, in a way, than the victim perspective. So how would the, how would the Truth Commission have looked like? What would it have looked like if it had power to compel testimony, if people had come and talked about those things that were uncomfortable to many of the Aboriginal people. I don't think the, the, the way that the mandate was constructed is just the product of power being imposed. It was actually, according to Phil, Phil Fontaine and what he said about it, meant to make the space more comfortable to Aboriginal people. What would have happened if, if that hadn't been the way it was constructed? If the, if the discomfort of discordant opinion, of hearing 
from people who had uh, who were oriented towards Aboriginal assimilation were there t explaining themselves and, and explaining what was at the root of the ideology behind th this policy. Uh, and I saw you when you presented your book and you, you talked about this and, and why you'd chosen to interview priests and, and, and nuns and so on. And there, were, you know, there was a visceral response from some of the people present who had attended residential schools. It's like, no. Don't want to hear this. No. This, they had the floor for <laughs> far too long, it's our turn now, and how <coughs> dare you suggest that we should give these people a voice. Right. You know, and, um, and I yet, can understand that. I can understand <laughs> it too. And, but and shutting people down, I mean, I think we've maybe seen in the last couple of weeks what happens when people aren't allowed to say bad things. <laughs> There's a... Discomfort uncomfortable things. Yes. Confrontational things, right? And my, my sense is, yeah, I remember that very clearly. I think the, the, it was in this room. In and this the, room. the words were something like, they, they've had the dominant discourse for more than 100 years. Now it's our turn, right? And, and, and I understand that. And I've heard it more than once, by the way. Um, and yet, if, if we follow Hannah Arendt's example in her, in her book on Eichmann, if, you're, if you are to do something about institutional evil, you need, you need to explore it. You need to deal with that discomfort. Otherwise, it remains a mystery to you. And, and you don't learn lessons that follow from it. And her felicitous term, the banality of evil, comes from that, from that exploration. Looking at it deeply, listening to it, and seeing how ordinary it is. And this, I think, is something that came out of the TRC itself. That these, uh, these schools were the, and the, the abuses that happened in them were the products of sort of very banal, many of them, very banal bureaucratic decisions, policy decisions that originated in the ideas of, of yes, a dominant society, but a, you know, a group of government officials that had the power to do this and to keep it going. This might bring us back to some of the stuff you had said earlier, right? You, right? Just now, you're using words like bureaucracy, officials, right, which have to do with a form of political organization right. tied to the state, right? And yes. so that's kind of interesting. What if you don't have these exceptional evil people or thoughts, but there are, there's a way of being in the world that leads more readily to this kind of thing than other ways of being? Then that's kind of uh, scary to the extent that then the work of a TRC such as this wouldn't be to move from a bad state to a good state, but potentially, as some indigenous authors are, are, are suggesting, is to question the, the political form of the state itself, right? And so, again, with Eichmann and bureaucracy, officialdom, these are all also ways of how we tend to experience law. There's a special group of people who are officials, who are tied to the power of the state, right? And so that's also maybe a, re, a, a kind of invitation to, to rethink. Right. Law and policy, right? The policy that develops within the apparatus of the state. And then we're returning to the, to the calls to action again, which as you pointed out, are themselves uh, constructed around some of these categories that are familiar to us, right? Education, religion, law. So the in, in a way, the TRC and its calls to action are replicating some of those legal constructions that are part of a bureaucratic structure. And the TRC is a bureaucracy in itself, right? So there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a tension there, I think, between the, the kinds of uh, policy change that the TRC is calling for and, and these elements of policy in itself, policy and law that are part of a form of thinking that is at the root in some ways of, the, of where, the, where it can go astray. This brings us back to what Kirsten was saying about John Burroughs uh, using a, a story and then translating it into, into a case, right? And saying, well, that could be the work of the trickster.
And so perhaps that's the kind of question you're raising too. Are you stuck in the forms that you're adopting or can you use them ironically? Can there be there's something going on that's going to challenge the very form in which it's, it, it's taking place? We can keep going, <laughs> but we've already used an, an hour of our time. Can you believe it? It's gone by so fast. If, if, if the audience members have been uh, sort of ruminating on this conversation, if anything has twigged um, and you have any questions, I'm happy to open the floor uh, to the people who are here. Yes? Sure, I'm thank you. Uh, Professor Ann, thank you. Space at the beginning, and then we talked about space and the role of authority in space. And so I was thinking, in uh, bringing more indigenous legal orders and teachings into a, a place like McGill, what is the role of the institution, law well, faculties like McGill, in changing, adapting, working with space in a different way? Because of course, no, no space or design is, is neutral, and there's a lot about space that. Um, is uncomfortable in indigenous traditions, the way space is organized uh, here, for instance. I, I know we're, we're working on it as a, as a faculty. <laughs> I don't have really great answers, except that it, it might cut really deep. And so I don't know, how, so many things could change, right? So that one of the things that's happening lately, I think, in education is, uh, is we've got more and more transparency. You've got to announce all your objectives up front in a syllabus. There's a certain performance of the rule of law and consumer protection. There's a tendency to want everyone to speak on point and then to respond directly to the previous speaker. And for me, it's like, whoa, well, all of that stuff itself might be counter to another tradition of speaking and listening to one another, where you don't force someone to respond directly to what someone else says before, where you might listen carefully over a longer period of time. So I've been thinking a lot, not necessarily doing a good job of enacting it, about what nonviolent speech uh, and to what extent can we speak nonviolently and to what extent is some of what we associate with the rule of law and transparency and people knowing things up front potentially in some settings problematic or, or violent. And so I, I hear what you're saying, and I just want to, I guess, blow it up and or keep okay. running with it. So it's not just the, the space, but the circulation of affect and the way we want directness and things on point. I'm curious about how specific those expectations and desires are and to what extent they, they're themselves performances of, of a kind of violence and disrespect for the autonomy of, of others. Kirsten, you might have another angle to approach this from. So I was just, I, yeah. I mentioned the law as dream or dream jurisprudence before, and I've been thinking, uh, thinking a lot lately about uh, what it is about. So what happens to our minds in a dream state? Well, there's a you know, neuro neurobiological explanation for that, um, that uh, our brain, the, the degree of entropy in our brain increases in dream states, in hallucinations, in certain kind of... Um, kind of meditative states and so on. Um, and so what that means, entropy is, is uh, you know, randomness in the system and it allows like connections to be made that might not, so patterns to be noticed, things like that. So dreams are often you know, a reflection of different patterns that we live through. If you do something repetitive a lot, sometimes that comes through in your dreams. So you know, thinking about instead of the kind of the rational thought where you kind of pursue an end, like we know what we're supposed to learn in this class and we're gonna pursue it and it's all on point and, and so on, like to contrast that to the brain state of what a dream is, you know, and about the sort of associational thinking, metaphor and so on, Im imagery, those kind of qualities to thought and how, I mean, I can't go into it here, but how, you know, the, how, what Sarkar Henderson might mean to say that dreams are a source of law, uh, that, that sort of gives a, a different angle to it. Um, and in terms of space, uh, it's something I've been thinking a lot um, because of the classes I teach, we're about to move to uh, trans-systemic property courses as well, and we're thinking about how to take the class out of the classroom because, uh, you know, when you have a tradition, we talked about how language is tied to place and law, you know, that, that people talk about learning the law from the land. So you can talk about it in the classroom, but how can you learn the law directly from the land in that, in that, con in that setting. So um, field courses are a way that uh, a number of different institutions are, are moving to try and engage with these aspects of indigenous thought and practice. Um, I'm excited to see where that goes. Yes. 
my question is about the difference between the words Aboriginal and Indigenous. Uh, what those mean to you both, especially um, Professor Antaki, with your interest in language, and then in your, I guess, specific work with Indigenous uh, law, and all three of you, really. I can tell you the answer is not going to be short at all. <laughs> okay. He wrote a book on it. <laughs> myself there you know there's actually a, now there has developed more pejorative nature around the word aboriginal which perhaps didn't exist even a year or two ago um, and so I'm wondering um, how we negotiate those words now mm -hmm. whether we are shifting uh, towards indigenous all out or if there's a purpose to the word that mm -hmm. word aboriginal for example I've heard that aboriginal law um, is a representative is representative of Canadian law state law about Indigenous peoples and indigenous laws that comes from communities. That's how I tend to use it. I, when I'm talking about Section 35 or legal texts that use the word Aboriginal, I, you know, that's part of that discourse, and I sort of use it in inverted commas, like invisible inverted commas. And Indigenous, I respect. I mean, Professor Neeson has written a book on the growth of the category of Indigenous at an international and um, global, you know, international law level. Um, it seems to have been a term that I've noticed in my travels and being in Australia and being here. It's the term that people have adopted themselves when they're engaging at, in that, at that international uh, level. It's not without its own problems. And of course, I think the, polit the general politics around it is if you can be specific, do, right? Because each community has its own name for itself and its own language, and you know, I try and respect that. But sometimes we do need broader categories, and um, certainly those are categories that have been produced from experiences of colonization, but you can't wish them away, and they are reality as well. So. Um, well, I, I'm really interested in, in language and etymology, but there are circumstances in which it's not about figuring out what the etymology of the word reveals, but it's about understanding how the w word resonates and with whom and how, and then being context sensitive as to what word you ought to be using rather than having one word that's supposed to be the right word in, in every context. So I guess your question for me is an invitation to listen better and more uh, about how words kind of travel across different contexts without presuming that, you know, I can play it safe if I speak this way and I don't then need to worry about who I'm with or what I'm talking about, which makes things more tricky and difficult, I guess. So, Kirsten has mentioned the specificity of, of self-designation. My sense is that whenever, whenever you go beyond that to try to include uh, a national entity of people who are governed in a particular way by particular instruments, you're going, you're going to create a fence to that se sensitivity uh, every time. So Aboriginal is doing that. Uh, First Nations is, is doing that in a similar way. So what is it that people are, are doing? What is it that they're, why is it that these terms persist? It, it, the, the difference between Aboriginal and Indigenous in this sense has to do with empowerment and with aspirations to self-determination. Um, to the extent that those aspirations are realizable within the state, the, the term will be acceptable. The reason that indigenous tends to be more acceptable to rights claimants is simply because in international law, there is a space for people to come together uh, to share common cause and to work in, in, in sort of groups to talk back to international law, to talk back to states, to try to sort of use that space, however state-centric it is, to move ahead with rights claims and politics at the international level. Um, in a way, it didn't begin that way. It began in the, uh, with the ILO, with an assimilative orientation, and it acquired it acquired its current usage through the participatory action of indigenous peoples starting in the 19, uh, late 70s, 80s, 90s, to the point that it's a very, the focal point of important, uh, an important uh, international rights movement. I say international self-consciously because it's set within, excuse me, within a, an international law structure, right? So who's to say that there isn't some other 
form of some other word that can then that can then be a focal point of rights and recognition and that then people begin to use that self-referentially. It's impressive how indigenous is taken off. John Stewart used it. You know, if John Stewart uses it in the Daily Show, wow, everybody knows what this term means. It's naturalized to the point that it's part of our language. Everybody in that bubble. Everybody in that, in that filter bubble, right? We talked about filter bubbles. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the role of truth and reconciliation commissions in comparative perspective with regards to power. I mean, this is uh, maybe I'm being a little bit too uh, uh, optimistic with truth and reconciliation commissions, but we have someone from Australia here. We have several faculty members who have experiences with other truth and reconciliation commissions in the context of minority rights. Uh, aside from redeeming a human rights situation, how can we get a Truth and Reconciliation Commission right so that they become a powerful tool for political empowerment for these empowered groups? What could we do better um, for, for making them a, a, a tool for empowering these minority groups? My sense of that is two things. One is calibrating the Truth Commission in an appropriate way to the circumstances that it's meant to address. So, lessons learned about Canada's Truth Commission, I think we, we could think about it in another way. There are other ways to do it, other possibilities that might have been less comfortable, but that might have led to uh, a certain form of dialogue, right? And discomfort, actually, is, is something that is more if you're looking at the publicity goals of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, it's, it's, it, it would be more of a source of meet its educational goals in a better way, I think. Um, in, in an, another thing that Truth Commissions need to do, that Canada's did in, in, a, in a fairly decent way, is um, is be attentive to the people who are the subjects of the of the commission without without i would say without defining them without placing them in in categories in in the tr in the truth commission that is sort of being planned in colombia it, it was the catholic church who defined who it was that were, that could be victims and could re represent themselves in the talks so it's very sort of, truth commissions have a tendency to be very sort of top down in how they understand victimhood and how they understand what it is to be a survivor. And people complained about this even in South Africa's uh, truth commission that's become a reference point for the, for the institution. Um, people who spoke talked about how the commission, sometimes talked about how the commission tended to uh, create uh, categories around their testimony that it had to fit into. So I think that, that those two things, the, the idea of designing it around the power relationships that the commission begins with and the particular de needs and demands of the people who have, who have stories to tell are, are important ingredients. Might, um, maybe you have something to add to that. Well, I, I guess I would just follow through with what you said and maybe speak to, uh, without having a general recipe, that maybe some of how we tend to think will separate the kind of institutional and the cultural or the symbolic, and that these are not, this is not the place to indulge in that, right? To, to think not just about the institutional side of things, but what scripts and performances and genres are being invoked and reworked confessional, testimonial, right? There's a lot of stuff going on that's not just institutional, that's about how people perform and feel. And so that has to be central, which I guess is tied to what you were saying about being very attentive to, to, um, to, to the to context. So the calibration here is not just institutional, it's, it's, it's uh, aesthetic, it's, it's cultural. Yeah. 
Australia didn't have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, it had a, a reconciliation movement, and while I kind of talked up the, the grassroots a <laughs> aspect of it, I mean, whether that actually carried through into policy is, you know, debatable, uh, and certainly didn't stop some horrific things from happening in terms of uh, sort of basically a takeover of Indigenous territories in the Northern Territory. Um, um, there was sort of a split between kind of symbolic re reconciliation or recognition and, and practical reconciliation, which is seen as being um, focusing on socio socioeconomic indicators. And just as you were talking, I just I just kept thinking about the like neoliberalism as the context for all of this, right? So um, the the takeovers of communities in the Northern Territory was premised on yes. A, Equality, but not, you're not there yet, right? So we have to take over things for you because you know then we can start reconciliation. Like once you're up to scratch and, and everything, you know. Wasn't that also related to things like sexual abuse and alcohol abuse, right, in the communities, right, which prompted an intervention? Yes, so it's on the, path path of the, children. the pathologies that are the result of right. domination right. and inequality and dispossession that then justify the intervention again. Right. But also that you know, so and so much of this is happening in a context of, of resource exploitation and and the need. Like we can't we can't do anything about this because we need to mine this land and we need to destroy the reef and we need to do this. Otherwise, our economy is going to sink. Right. Yes. Um, so I have a question to pick up on the distinctions you've been drawing between essentialization and generalization and then in particular. Um, and so in particular, I was struck when you mentioned Portuguese and the indigenous communities say that they have a way of resolving conflict between themselves, but not with kind of the uh, institutional state structures. And so I'm just wondering then, if we're being attentive to kind of recognizing distinctions between communities, is it a generalization to say that they have the tools to communicate and resolve conflicts, or like, what, what allows then, despite differences, to resolve those conflicts, and then if there are ways of resolving those conflicts, what could be, like, could something be learned for bringing that to another level of conflict evolution? Um, I'm just wondering how, if they're so different, they can resolve conflicts in a way that seems to be uh, not working at this other level. In the example that I used, um, uh, I think that if I, if I generalized from that to say that, um, that indigenous people in Canada have, have these tools to reconcile among themselves uh, as a generalization, that would be an essentialism uh, that I would be guilty of. Um, but um, again, uh, going to, to each of these communities and, and to the people who came to the TRC to give testimony that I saw, there is a sense that um, what was emerging out of the, that what was emerging out of the TRC and its activities was an, an effort, the first instance of reconciliation was within uh, families and communities of survivors. That's simply what I saw. And what I also saw was um, certain church-led initiatives that led to, gradually, to people's involvement in some of the things the churches were doing. But what I didn't see was a sort of a wider movement or effort at reconciliation that was addressing the kinds of things that the TRC tried to do in its recommendations, in its calls to action. That wasn't, to me, front and center in, in the efforts of reconciliation as the Commission did its activities. And that, to me, was sort of interesting, that you could have a that you could have th these activities that were, that were sort of institutionally uh, isolated from the, from the government that was responsible and its re sort of re reluctance to take part and still end up with 
uh, a result, a written result, a policy, a policy result in the calls to action that addressed a lot of these issues. Um, I don't know if I've answered your question at all. I think I might have misunderstood. I think the way I interpreted what you were saying was that there were methods for conflict resolution, like intra community. Right. In many places. Sorry, inter right. community conflict resolution, but what you're talking about was actually intra community. So there was the ability to respond to mm -hmm. conflict within, within the community. The community It was within, within, I meant within the communities. There could well be with it within, within different ab Aboriginal communities, but there's also conflict within ab uh, different Aboriginal communities as, as well, and some of which becomes the focal point of efforts at legal mediation and, and dispute resolution by the state or by mediators that they bring in. This, this question of um, you know, whether we can assume or just generalize and say, you know, these all that indigenous peoples must have some sort of dispute. This is the same, the same issue as saying, do all peoples have law or are there some peoples who don't have law? And in some ways, anthropologists do have to start off from some kind of essentialist position because you assume that we're dealing with people who have culture, who have law and so on. And that's just a starting point. We then find out, well, maybe, oh, you don't want to call it law, but what, what, do, you call what it? do you call it? Do you call it something? So it's the beginning of an inquiry uh, rather than the end of the inquiry. Um, and certainly there are, you know, groups who would say, well, treaty was one way that we dealt with. <laughs> you, you, you guys didn't, Europeans didn't make up treaty. <laughs> like, it was here before. Um, the Haudenosaunee talk about having, uh, um, um, uh, what's it called? I'm having a mental blank, but uh, different, uh, you know, protocols and rituals for, for dealing with inter-nation, um, you know, conflict and agreements and so on. Um, so, like as a starting point, I think you can use it as a base for inquiry, but then you, you always have to get down to the particulars in each case. I guess I'm curious about the, when you say what well, you must, what you call it, well then we presume the constancy the of, of, right. The, right. of the it, right? Which, I don't know, I find that kind of interesting that there are its that we've identified in one language and then we kind of presume that those its Right, but you have to be persist. willing to let go of that as well, right? You know, I, I, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I find that kind of interesting. Like, what are the it's we hold on to? You must have some equivalent for this. You, I think, I'm just curious about well, th that. And the essentialist starting point comes out of something that happened before, which was that colonization happens at least in part because it was assumed that certain people didn't have government and law and that could justify taking them over. So it was kind of a response to that, not just a question coming out of nowhere, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the United States Supreme Court has said that the melting pot is not a legal concept, but a social one. So they have a void to define that element. So when it comes to Canada, we have multiculturalism. And uh, Part of what is happening not only in the United States, in Europe, in Latin America, with nationalism, they are paying the success of the melting pot now is reverting back. So now uh, we move from having a, a president that is the second generation of African immigrants, supercar justices from Hispanic uh, cultures and different backgrounds everywhere. And we have this severe reaction from the majority that feels threatened. But this is happening also in Europe, and actually in Latin America in the last elections. So the world is now looking at Canada differently. That is part of the role that Canada has played with the, with the refugee crisis, the way that Canadians have welcomed refugees, and the humanitarian role that the Prime Minister is, is dealing and is exposing worldwide. But there is a concept for, for those who are immigrants that comes to multiculturalism. And every time we ask about that to a Canadian, or somebody who is not Canadian and has been living here, you always find different responses. And I would like to know your opinion about the fact on whether this call, call open actions, especially the last one, the 94, that says that we are going to respect the trees with the Aboriginal uh, groups. This process has changed anything in multiculturalism in Canada? Considering both realities, not just your internal or domestic reality, but also the perhaps the unique opportunity that Canada has to build and doctrine international law in 
terms of humanitarian role that Canada is playing. It's, it's really unique in that position. So how this plays around? You're looking at me. I'm the moderator. Uh, well, are you referring to the, the last call to action, the oath of citizenship, which yes. would, that, that the oath would include uh, um, an oath to re respect treaty mm -hmm. rights? I think that's what you're referring to. Is, is that right? Yeah? You mean the 94? The, the last? Yeah. yeah. Yes, it's it just that it's surprising that when you will become citizen, yeah. Canada, now you have this mention that Aboriginal group. So it seems it is a new step in multiculturalism. How, how that place? I wouldn't necessarily see that as a new step in multiculturalism because you have the queen and now you have treaties. So I don't see that as cultural. I see that as, as political. It's about allegiance. It's, it's about uh, political allegiance. Uh, so I wouldn't see that as, as multicultural. I would see that as a taking out of multiculturalism uh, questions of, of uh, reconciliation and, uh, and, and self-determination of, of, of indigenous peoples. I would see it as taking it out, which would be a reversal of, for example, white paper. Or it would be a reversal of maybe previous attempts to make questions of recognition cultural and not political, right? So it, this seems like a move to politics because it's an oath, right, which has to do with allegiance. Uh, so I, I wouldn't see it as playing into multiculturalism, but as taking the question out of multiculturalism, and, potentially. And, and the same thing for treaties. It's, treaties are not, so sometimes Aboriginal rights have been treated as cultural claims, right, instead of part of a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. Uh, and this. Now there's a, a discourse to highlight the fact that treaties are not just for Aboriginal peoples, but they were a compact between two groups of people and, and non-Aboriginal peoples are also beneficiaries of the treaties, have obligations under the treaties and benefits under the treaties. And that is in part where we get legitimacy for being here because the land was shared with us. So to invite um, newcomers to be aware of that they're stepping into their role as a partner as a beneficiary of those treaties, I think is an important way of not just reframing multiculturalism versus citizenship, but also reframing the treaty, the treaties. But we haven't addressed your big question. <laughs> um, and the, the, the big question is, what is there in this that is at the foundation of Canada being, representing something different in, in a world that's seemingly turned towards nativism and intolerant nationalism? And, and my sense is that, that when you have a polity that is having to grapple with difference be, beyond a kind of co color accommodating cultural difference and ethnicity in a melting pot, but actually that, is, that has its reference point in legal, cultural uh, uh, difference through, throughout the, the nation's history where there's a kind of a deep difference that's inscribed in the law, in constitutional relationships with a whole variety of different peoples. I think that when you have a polity that's based on that foundation, you have something that makes it almost impossible to, to advocate for a kind of a a purity, a nationalism that goes back to the comforts of a single identity. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, the anchorage of Canadian politics in, in a legal diversity of this kind um, is, is a hedge against the kinds of politics that we're seeing elsewhere in the world. And that might explain how it is that despite the comings and goings of different kinds of of uh, federal policy, we, we, we have a sort of solid bedrock of commitment to diversity in the way that you've described. Let's hope. Yeah. Shall we end it on that note? I see people nodding. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your questions. Thanks to my two panelists. <laughs>